thank Boss here. Yes. I think uh, in 995 when we went to Malawi, you were still taller than I was. <laughs> <laughs> Now, well, what, a <laughs> what a great privilege to, uh, to really just be able to grow together. And uh, <laughs> yeah, to be able to experience the grace of the Lord together. I was, uh, yeah, it's a good thing we're friends because we, we, we've got a few stories about one another that uh, probably shouldn't be told from the pulpit. But uh, we've seen incredible things together just in the, in the presence of the Lord and on those mission trips and, and just worshiping God together. I remember just standing here in the presence of God and, and just thinking how our lives were shaped and changed. We met in the, in the Nielsie, in the Frauer Vereniging and in the Sanlam Hall. And just on nights like this, you know, 22 years ago, uh, we were just like, we would literally, you couldn't talk very often after, after service because your voice was just gone. <laughs> just worshiping the Lord and just soaked up. Our gym sessions usually would be just coming to church, jumping up and down. See us, we jump on tables in the library, but don't tell anyone. And uh, it was just like, just amazing. And, and I know that's where a lot of our strength came from. Uh, the things the Lord has built into our lives over the years were shaped and forged here in, in God's presence. And, and so Ryan and I, we were praying beforehand. By the way, thank you for sending Ryan to us. See us, thank you for releasing Ryan and just Ryan and Jean Marie, they, they were district leaders here, but then some of the West now is many of you guys will be as well in a, in a little while. Many of you will heed the call of the Lord to come. I think Natalie, I got a word for you as well that you're coming to some of the West soon and Martin, you as well. But apparently, see us is renting you out. He wants money for you to come and inspire my volunteers. But uh, that was just amazing. I was just like, whoa, now I must preach after that. <laughs> it's like a, a massive high standard. But you know, I was, I was just so blessed praying before and for this congregation and just realizing how many of our other congregations are just blessed because of Stellenbosch. You know, we were pastoring up in Pretoria and in Johannesburg and, and all of those congregations are reaping the fruit and the benefit of this congregation. And so I really just want to honor you guys. Thank you for being faithful. Pastor C. is just standing the test of time. You know, he's even crazier for Jesus than what he was back then. Still loves Jesus, still loves souls uh, much more than he did uh, 22 years ago when I met him, and so I really want to honor you, man of God, for being my friend, being faithful, being consistent, and um, we have, we're in the same region, and both of I, we, uh, we, we have a challenge with meetings, just doing meetings for the sake of doing meetings, and so uh, we run a very effective region, meetings are kept to a minimum, um, but uh, we share words of knowledge and wisdom, and, and uh, just like in prayer together, it's just been an amazing journey, growing together, and he asked me to come and minister on relationships, and so somebody earlier this evening asked me, what kind of relationships are you going to be ministering on? I'm like, oh, that's a good question. Eh? I'm going to minister on relationships, okay? It's the, the gospel deals with relationships. It is impossible to talk about the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and not talk about relationship. Um, the gospel, its very essence, is not a program. It's not a set of rules. It's not a bunch of religious doctrines. The gospel, in its essence, deals with relationship. And it deals with not just a relationship to come or something which we need to do in order to win someone's approval. It deals with how our relationship has been changed by God. That we once were enemies to God. We once were foreigners to God. We once um, were, were subjects of His wrath. But He sent Jesus Christ to reconcile us back to Him. And so the gospel isn't about what we need to do. The gospel is about what has been done for us. Relationally that we have been pulled closer into God's bosom. And one of the great blessings for me was, was growing up here as a student when I arrived in 1994. I loved the Lord Jesus dearly already. One of the great privileges of growing up in a godly home. But, but it was a year where a lot of my, my life was shaped and formed as well. And it was a year that I met my wife, uh, my beautiful wife, uh, Nikki. She's a, just a tremendous um, support to me. I, I love her with all of my heart. And and she's been through thick and thin with me. She's been a great support to me. But I met her here in Stellenbosch. And um, I remember a group of friends, we were busy praying for a particular house. I think I shared this story with you a while ago. But there was this house that the Lord led us to pray for. You know, sometimes the Holy Spirit just, it drops a name into your heart. You know, when you need to pray for something, you need to pray for someone. And um, 
just this house and the names of these people living in this house was dropped into our spirits by, by the Lord. You know, and we started praying for this house. And uh, uh, this house happened to have some of the most beautiful women live, living there, but that had nothing to do with why we were praying for them. Okay, we were praying for them completely unselfishly. We were just like focused on the kingdom of God. We just wanted godly women to come into the kingdom. Okay, that is why we were praying. There were no ulterior motives. Um, but as we were praying for this house, one after the other got saved. Pastor Henny's um, wife, Pastor Henny up in Johannesburg, his wife lived there, and my wife lived there as well. And uh, eventually, <laughs> as if I had an ulterior motive, it just happened to work out that way, okay? The fruit of our spiritual labor. Uh, we were praying, and, and we were unselfish, and um, really worked out a strategy. We were prayer mapping and prayer walking, and, and really trusting God to do great things in that house. And, and almost all of those girls got saved and ended up being in my small group, and uh, so it was amazing. <laughs> An amazing time. Um, but, uh, but we were friends for 10 years before we got married. Okay? And um, it was amazing just to, to develop that friendship. That is not a word for someone. Okay, see, some of you guys are getting very despondent right now. You're like, oh, no. <laughs> Another 10 years. Brother, it's okay, okay? It's all right. That's not, it wasn't a word for you. You can relax. But what was amazing was getting to know her within the context of friendship and uh, getting to know her without the pressure of trying to have to impress her. Um, just getting to know her as a, as a sister in the Lord and, and being able to be honest with her and to get to know her within the context of her family and, and my family. And so I want to share with you guys a little bit this evening around just some principles I've discovered over the years. But you know, one of the big blessings now is that we have a, a beautiful family, We've got a boy and two girls and and uh, we had the privilege of going to Springbok a while ago, and um, it was just an amazing time. Uh, we tried to incorporate our holidays with mission, and so we went to Springbok, and we spent some time there. You guys know where Springbok is? Beautiful town in Namakwa land, yes. It's flower time now, so go there, go and visit them, go and bless them. But we have a shofar congregation there as well, an amazing group of people. They love the Lord dearly. But you know, sometimes you go on mission, and you think you're going to be a blessing to, to someone or to a place. And you walk away from them knowing they were a greater blessing to you. you know, and that was the same for us going to Springbok. You know, one of those, those missions that sort of, I almost want to say, destroyed my life in a certain way. You know, upset my life. You know, just change, upset a whole lot of stuff inside of me, the way I was thinking about stuff. Uh, um, people so incredibly poor and yet so rich in love, rich in joy, <laughs> rich in a passion for God. I'll never forget this one lady um, standing up and we were ministering on forgiveness and and she says, this, 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 this morning, the Lord just laid it on my heart that I need to forgive some people. And so she starts sharing this story about how she is now a grandmother raising her two grandchildren and having to look after her two daughters as well. And she's a pensioner, but her two daughters can't look after their children because they, they're drug addicts. They, they're tick addicts. They're completely addicted, and they've been addicted to tick since high school. And her husband, when she was pregnant with the eldest girl, committed suicide. I'm, I'm listening to this woman, I'm thinking like, auntie, I didn't know this about you. This entire week we were together in intercession and you were praising God and you had this joy about you. Meanwhile, your world is falling apart. You know, the, the, those, those, those girls, as, as soon as she gets her pension, she has to hide the money away from them because they will use it to go and buy drugs. As soon as somebody blesses them with something, they sell the furniture in the house because they're so addicted so devastated. And then she says, and today the Lord has laid it on my heart that, that I need to forgive the drug dealer that introduced my two high school girls to drugs. And then I'm like, oh, what godliness. That's the power of the gospel right there, that, that ability to be able to forgive in a, such an amazing way. And, and so Springbok really was such a, like I said, it messed with my heart. It challenged me in a lot of ways in which I relate to people around me and the way I relate to the Lord. Uh, but we came home one day, and I've got a five-year-old little girl, and, uh, and she said, Daddy, um, I want to play you something. Okay, and so I want to play this for you. Those of you guys who don't understand Afrikaans, bear with us. I trust the Lord for interpretation of tongues. But I, I, trust, I trust the Lord that you'll be able to catch the, the gist uh, behind it. Okay, but this is her 
mission feedback. Um, thanks. <laughs> So yeah, we, that's why I wanted to tell the story first. Okay, we did more in Springbok than just drink milkshakes. And, uh, <laughs> but yeah, it was amazing to have them go with us to the old age home, to the hospitals, and to see them love upon people. So naturally, Katie doesn't have the problem. She doesn't believe in singing in the closet. She believes everybody needs to hear. <laughs> she, uh, <laughs> she often says, boy, I'm a genius. <laughs> she just got a very good self-image and... and um, takes after her mom, knows who she is. But um, so it's a blessing having a family. So it's a blessing um, serving the Lord as a family. And, and uh, I just wanted to chat to you guys this, this evening a little bit about just God's master plan. And I, I want to encourage you to go with me to, to Genesis 1. And I don't know where you guys are in your journey in terms of you know, why you came tonight to the relationship talk. I don't know what your, your heart's desire is. Um, back in the day, when we were still students, we had a newsletter, and in the newsletter, there was a, a section on relationships called In the Garden. I don't know whether you can still remember, see us. And in the Garden were for those in relationships. On the way to the Garden were for those uh, um, that were planning to pursue someone or busy pursuing someone, and then there was nowhere near the Garden for those who didn't have any hope. You know, so it was like in the Garden, on the way to the Garden, and nowhere near the Garden. So I don't know where you are. Okay, in that spectrum, but there's hope for you wherever you are, whether you're in the garden and you want to trust the Lord for an increase in your relationship, whether you're on your way to the garden, you trust the Lord for boldness and courage to take a step, whether you're nowhere near the garden, you're trusting God just to send an angel or speak to you. I believe that tonight God knows where you are, He knows what concerns you, He knows your fears, He knows your baggage, He knows exactly how to speak to your heart. And so, I want to just pray for us. Father, thank you so much that this evening, God, this is about you. This isn't even about us. This isn't even about our story, God. It's about your story and your engagement with us. So thank you that we can come and, and we can surrender to you, Father. And we pray that this evening, Lord, you would have your way with our hearts. Holy Spirit, we trust you. We love you. We rely upon you. Thank you, Jesus, for being with us. We can love you because you first loved us. In Jesus' name, amen. Genesis 1, chapter 26. God spoke. Most of creation happened because God spoke. Amen. That's why some of you guys need to get the word back into your life so you can start speaking and creating things in your life. And speak the word. God spoke. And he said, let us make human beings in our image. Let's make them reflecting our nature so they can be responsible for the fish in the sea, the birds in the air, the cattle in years earth itself and every animal that moves on the face of the earth. God created human beings and he created them God-like, reflecting God's nature. He created them male and female. Right, so here we see right at the very beginning, God, um, in eternity past, before anything else was um, created in terms of who we are and for any human being lifted, God had this conference in heaven. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. 
And they sat down and they said, let us create. Let us create mankind. Let us create humanity, male and female. And let us create them so that they can reflect who we are. Let us create them not so that they can be us, but let us create them so that when nature looks at them, they can see something of who we are. Again, that is important because that is the purpose and that is the destiny for every human relationship upon the face of the earth. It is that God puts relationships together, be it relationships within church, relationships within family, and He puts those relationships together so that the world can look at our relationships and they can see something about God. All right, so God didn't create mankind because God was lonely. It's important for us to understand that. He didn't create mankind so that He could understand what love is. He didn't even create mankind so that He could express love for the first time. God was already busy expressing love within the Godhead. The Father loved the Son, and the Son loved the Father and the Holy Spirit. They loved each other. They already were in community with one another. They already were in perfect submission to one another. They were already in perfect reverence towards each other. And what they were creating was creating an opportunity for us to be drawn into their community to be drawn into their way of living, to be drawn into what they were sharing between one another already. I mean, if you look at the New Testament, it is obvious Jesus came and Jesus said, if you see me, you see the Father. (laughs) I'm here not to do my own plans. I'm not here to do all the miracles that I've done, multiplying the fish and the bread, calming the storms, driving out the demons, raising the dead. None of those miracles is about me, Jesus said. I'm not here to build my own name or my own kingdom. I'm not here to do my own agenda. I'm here so that when you look at me, you can see my Father. I live to do the will of my Father. My bread, Jesus said, is to do the will of my Father. So Jesus was on Father God's mission. He loved us and He died for us. But He didn't die for us primarily because we were so wonderful. He died for us because that is what Father God requested of Him. He died to please the Father. (laughs) That is why Jesus died. The joy set before him was knowing that I am pleasing my Father. And that is why Father God then, in turn, for Jesus, says, Jesus, your name is going to be the primary name through which I will manifest who I am. The name of Jesus is above every other name. The name of Jesus is even above Elohim and Jehovah. All the other manifestations of God's name is subservient to the name of Jesus. So Father God says to Jesus, Jesus, your name will be the name by which mankind will know God, Jesus. What does the Holy Spirit do? You you remember Jesus, before he goes away, he tells the disciples, guys, I know having me with you is awesome and you're excited about the miracles, but guess what? It's better for you that I go away because someone awesome is coming. The Holy Spirit is coming. So Jesus was preparing the way for the Holy Spirit. He's like, Guys, you've you've got to wait for the Holy Spirit. Go to Jerusalem and wait for the Holy Spirit. He will come and He will change everything. He will remind you of the things that I've told you. He will fill you with boldness. He will fill you with power. The Holy Spirit is amazing. What does the Holy Spirit do? The Holy Spirit then just draws everybody to the Father again. So within this Godhead, there's no competition. There's no competition there. Everyone respects the other one, esteems them higher. So for me as a husband, you know what? The standard... For my marriage, isn't Sias's marriage as amazing as Sias's marriage is? Isn't my mom and dad's marriage as amazing as that is? The standard for my marriage is God's relationship that He has in community. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's the standard. The standard for us in this congregation, the way we treat one another, isn't how the church next door treats their congregation members. Isn't how you have been treated. The, the standard is, how is God setting the standard? And so that's where I want to start. And I want to tell you that if you base your hope and if you base your expectation for your marriage and what your marriage can be like upon anything else except God, then you are going to be bitterly disappointed. Then you are selling yourself short because there's a beautiful, a glorious standard that can only be attained through the power of the Holy Spirit. Someone had a word earlier that there are some of you guys here that need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's sort of like, We're talking about relationships, but that is exactly the key for some of you. I'll never forget at the beginning, um, courting my wife, you know, we we had a wonderful time. Um, We were working already, and, you know, it was incredible. 
just getting to know her and opening up my heart to her. We were good friends. So I remember taking her out to, okay, I didn't have a lot of money. I was a teacher, okay, so don't judge me. Um, I took her to um, Mug and Bean, okay, just after, after she came from the gym. A strategic intervention, all right, I invited her. And um, so we sat down and then I started sharing just my heart with her. And I remember I was at home. Back then I was still, for a while I'd moved back in with my folks and I was living there with them and I'm ironing. Praise God, my mom taught me how to iron. So I'm ironing and I'm, I'm thinking, man, this is tough. I want to do this forever. No, I'm joking. That's not what I thought. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm ironing and, and then, you know, Nikki's face pops up into my heart and, you know, there were a few other brothers with me in small group, okay, that really liked my wife. Right? They really liked, I don't blame them. She's beautiful, so that makes sense. Okay, so I remember this one guy, he comes up to me and he says, I don't want to mess in your, I don't want to mess in your salad. How do you say that in English? I don't want to mess up your plans, you know. But um, would you mind if I take Nikki out? And, you know, I never, we weren't even dating. And I'm like, of course you can. It's got nothing to do with me. But I registered something in my heart going like, <laughs> you know, how, how dare he? And then this, then this other guy comes in, and he's planning a trip to the Kruger National Park, and he wants to take her along. Then I'm really going, Argh. you know, and so I'm ironing, and all this stuff is going through my mind, this earnest. I'm like, why am I feeling all of this earnest? And, um, and then I, I thought, if there's one person I want to spend the rest of my life with, who will that be? And it was an absolute no-brainer to me. I still ask my mom, what she thought, and I was off, and I immediately need to go, and so I invite Nikki, and we're going to have this, this, this lack of chat, and she trusted me, because I was a friend, you know, and so we sit down, and then I spill the beans, and I tell her, look, I, I really believe that everything that I've been through in my life has prepared me to love you like no other man can, right? That was my line, okay? You... <laughs> Okay, that was before Jerry Maguire's You Complete Me, okay? <laughs> you can use that line with permission. All right, so <laughs> I'm sitting there and I'm sharing that with her and she looks at me, kicks me underneath the table and she says, I just told her best friend that, you know, the reason I can trust Heinrich is because he's not going to mess up the friendship. <laughs> And then she doesn't talk to me for about two or three weeks, okay? It's just like silence, nothing. But, um, hey, camera, just, <laughs> can you focus in, zone in there? <laughs> I've got the prize. Nothing ventured, nothing gained. All right, guys, you've got to put it out on the table. <laughs> you've got to put it out there. <laughs> She's worth it. So what if she bats you? What if you get knocked out of the park? <laughs> you've got to do it for the right reasons. You've got to have a knowing. You've got to, you've got to make sure that this is, you're not going to mess with this girl's heart. So she comes back to me afterwards and she says to me, look, I love you as a friend. I'm not in love with you. But I trust you and I trust what Jesus is doing in your life. So if you can guarantee me this isn't a fling, because I say yes to dating you, we were 28, okay? So if you're 18, cut yourself some slack. <laughs> but if you are serious, that we're going to walk this journey towards marriage, I'm not into wasting my time. I'm like, whoa, <laughs> okay? I'm like, no, of course. Yeah, that's why I signed up for this. The Lord made some miracles happen, and, but you're not yet to listen to my boring story. So, the reason why I'm telling you that is I, from the beginning, trusted the Lord. My mom told me, Heinrich, look for a woman that loves Jesus more than she loves you. Because your marriage and your relationship isn't even about you. It's about God. <laughs> it's about pleasing God. It's about God's purpose for your life. And if, if you don't have that as a foundation of your life, if you don't have in your heart a, a solid understanding that I'm not looking for someone to complete me, 
I'm not looking to someone to deliver me out of my depression. I'm not looking for someone to fill the lonely void inside of my heart. I'm not looking for someone to give purpose to my life. Because God is the one giving purpose and sense to my life. He is giving meaning to my life. And I don't need a spouse to give me meaning. I don't need a spouse to give me joy. I don't need a spouse to give me significance. Jesus does that. If you don't have that as the foundation of your life, then you are not ready to court someone. Because you're going to idolize that person. And you're going to put all your weight of expectations upon the shoulders of one human being. And you're going to hold her responsible for keeping you happy. Fulfilling you, satisfying your longings and your deepest needs, making you feel good about yourself. I often have people coming for, for counseling and uh, premarital counseling and, um, and ask themselves, so, so why do you want to marry this lady? And then they give me all the reasons, and it's amazing reasons. Nobody says because I want to die. And that's actually why you're getting married. You want to die to yourself. <laughs> that's actually why God puts you together. You know, because God is committed to Christ's likeness, right? He's committed to you and to me becoming more like Christ. If you, if you didn't know that, that's God's purpose for your life, all right? Beyond all the other amazing things that He wants you to do, His purpose, His singular commitment to you is to make sure that at the end of your life, you look and sound a little bit more like Christ. That is his purpose for your life. Many of you are looking for purposes out there. Make a peace with that. Say, God, today, married, not married, single, kids, no kids, divorced, whatever. I am submitting myself to your purpose. I want to become more like Christ. And marriage is God's accelerated death sentence <laughs> on your life. Because it is in marriage that you actually begin to truly understand how much of you is still alive. <laughs> when you're single, you tend to think you're pretty awesome. You know, I did that, sitting there, all smug, thinking, man, I'm ready for this. <laughs> you know, I can love you. You know, I can, I can do this. You know, I'm not that bad. <laughs> I can do this. Didn't take me too long to figure out I cannot do this. <laughs> I cannot love this woman the way that she should be loved. I need an intervention. And the way for me to get there is consistently, step by step, every day, just dying to myself. And God uses marriage to kill you. That's the good news I have for you tonight. All right. God uses marriage to kill you. Killing you softly through marriage. Sometimes it kills you loudly because we moan and complain. But you know what is glorious? Because who needs more of my flesh? I certainly don't. I need more of Christ. I need more of his character. And he comes and he establishes that in our lives. And so what can you do as a single person? You can, even before you say yes to marriage, you can say yes to God, to his purpose. Say, so God, do whatever you need to do to kill me. That's why serving is such a beautiful, glorious thing. Because it kills you. To your own rights, to, this is my right now to just do nothing for a season. See how far your rights get you in the kingdom. The church life is all about, married life is all about walking away from your rights. It's all about, this is not about my rights. I remember teaching a poor person at the end, one of the matric years came and they gave me a, a Lord of the Rings trilogy, like a three box set, you know, like a lot of the Rings movies are quite long, probably like three hours or something, you know, it's a lot of stuff. Don't judge me for watching. I, I watched Lord of the Rings many years ago, okay? I'm not watching it anymore. But um, I, I used to watch those things. Like one, put it in, ah, then I'm done. You know, go outside, come back, put in another one, you know, another one, and then it's 24, you know, just one series after the other. And there's nothing wrong with that. I used to watch sports, you know, watch the five-day cricket, then watch the... Um, F1 for Ferrari racing, I watched the qualification, watched the actual race, you know, then I would finish off the Sunday with NBA, watching that after the church service. I was just like absorbed into doing things my way. Getting married delivers you out of that and gets you to a place where you start saying no to the series. You say no to the DSTV if you have to. You say no to whatever you need to say no to so that you can fulfill God's purpose. 
seeing the other person becoming everything God has called them to be. Marriage is about connecting. About connecting with God first. God's purposes and God's plans.